Hi, I'm Jared Gardner, and I'm here today with my fellow Ed Fulton. Uh, Ed has selected an interesting entity for us to discuss today. He always picks the most difficult things, but I think that they're uh, interesting things to discuss. So this is a tumor that's unusual and uh, rare, and it's called pleomorphic hyalinizing angiectatic tumor. And because that's a lot of syllables, we abbreviate it FAT, P-H-A-T, FAT with a PH. And so throughout the video, I'm going to try to make sure that if I'm actually talking about fat, F-A-T, fat, adipose tissue, that I say adipocytes or adipose tissue so I don't lead to um, unnecessary confusion. So fat is a, a, an unusual and rare tumor, and it's a tumor that's considered to be of intermediate malignancy. Most of these tumors are uh, seem to be benign and indolent, although they often recur locally, and rare cases have been reported to progress into like myxoid sarcomas and things that behave more aggressively, but most of them do not seem to metastasize or uh, cause patients to die. So that's good, but they're kind of an unusual and, un, and uh, not clearly defined category of behavior, so that's why we put them in this intermediate uh, malignancy category means we don't really have a full understanding probably of, of all of their behavior possibilities. So these tumors are really important though because they have a really unique um, feature and the most important feature you can see is right here in front of us these big dilated vessels. Let's look closer. These uh, dilated vessels are, are they're very dilated and they have a very unique feature in their the wall of the vessel the walls of the vessel are kind of expanded and really homogeneous and pink and that pink is either a mixture of either fibrin deposition and or collagen that's kind of layering around the vessels and if you're familiar with uh, another entity schwannoma which I haven't made a video about yet but I will at some point in the future and I'll put a link in the comments down below schwannoma tends to have vessels like this so this tumor um, is easily confused with schwannoma uh, the uh, So the one thing is this angiectatic uh, vessels, the dilated vessels with the homogenized uh, pink walls. The other thing, and if you could go back to the name, pleomorphic hyalinizing angiectatic tumor, we have the hyalinization here and the angiectasis, and then we also have pleomorphism. Look at this, the pleomorphic big hyperchromatic pleomorphic spindle cells in the background. And remember, pleomorphism is defined as a, a, multiple, a variation in nuclear size. And one way to look at pleomorphism that my mentor Jay Rowe uh, always liked to teach was that if, if you look at the largest tumor nucleus and um, a neighboring smaller tumor nucleus, if the, the larger nucleus is at least three times bigger than the smaller one, you can consider that as pleomorphism. Now, that's not a hard and fast rule, but I think it's a real nice rule of thumb to go by when you're in training and trying to learn how to, how to judge if something's pleomorphic. So that's what you have. You have a, a spindle cell tumor that has pleomorphism, has dilated vessels with hyalinized or fibrinoid material um, around the vessel wall, and, um, and that's a pleomorphic hyalinizing angiectatic tumor. So you might say, well, how do I know this is not a schwannoma? Well, one easy way to tell is that if you add an S100 stain, fat will be negative, P-H-A-T will be negative for S100. These tumors usually stain with CD34. They're CD34 positive like many other kind of fibroblastic tumors. Um, remember CD34, although it does stain vascular endothelial cells, it stains a wide variety of fibroblastic tumors. So it's not a very specific marker, but it is pretty useful in certain contexts. So these are usually CD34 positive, and also they will be negative for S100. So there's a few other things that can help us here with sorting this out. So that, that's one way to tell it apart from schwannoma. And even though schwannoma does have vessels like this, and from low power, uh, schwannoma with so-called ancient change, which gets big areas of hemorrhage and gets pleomorphic nuclei, it can really bear a lot of similarity to this. These tumors don't usually have the nuclear palisading, the varicae bodies that you'll often see in schwannoma, and again, the S100 is negative. The other big problem that you can have with, with fat is that because of the pleomorphism, it's easy to confuse it with um, a high-grade sarcoma, like undifferentiated pleomorphic sarcoma. And that's really important that you don't do that. Even though both fat and uh, high-grade sarcomas need to be excised with, uh, with wide local excision, with negative margins, ideally, uh, these tumors have a much better prognosis, uh, fat does, uh, has a much better prognosis than undifferentiated pleomorphic sarcoma. So it's important to make that distinction. So we, I showed you that there's pleomorphism in here. There's a lot of hemorrhage, too. Let's see if we can find some more pleomorphism. So as you're looking around though, you'll see pleomorphic hyperchromatic cells, 
But what you don't usually see is mitotic activity. And um, my mentor, Dr. Sharon Weiss, was uh, basically her, her study in the 1990s was the first paper to really characterize this entity. And uh, one of the points that was made is that to, to help tell this apart from a sarcoma is you look and uh, count 50 high power fields and you should usually find less than um, less than one mitosis and even 50 high power fields. So despite the pleomorphism, the mitotic activity is usually very low. Now I've seen some things that look a lot like fat and have some, some more um, mitoses than that. And that always makes me a little nervous and it always makes me worry, oh, could this actually be a sarcoma that has kind of fat-like changes that has these kind of uh, unusual ectatic vessels that are hyalinized. So I think it's important if, you're, if you see something that you think is, um, pleomorphic hyalinizing angiotatic tumor, but you start seeing mitotic figures, it might be a good time to get a consult from, from an expert who knows about these entities because I think that uh, there I have seen sarcomas that did have vessels that look kind of like this. Here's another area with, look at these very ectatic vessels. And here you can see that the walls are not only hyalinized, but they really have abundant pink, bright pink fibrin deposition in the vessel wall. And the vessels are kind of convoluted here. The lumens are convoluted. You can see the pleomorphic cells around the outside of the vessels. So this is pleomorphic hyalinizing angiotatic tumor. Um, because of all this uh, leaking damage to the vessel, you get not only fibrin and blood, you'll also often see hemosiderin. Let's see if we can get that to show up a little better. Hemosiderin deposition is a real common feature in these tumors. And remember, that's something that we often see in schwannomas too. Schwannomas will often have leaky blood vessels. They'll often have hemorrhage and hemosiderin. And I've definitely seen people confuse schwannoma with vascular tumors or other things like that because of the, the abundant uh, blood that's present in some cases. So that's those are the two main things that fat can get confused with is it can get confused with a high-grade pleomorphic sarcoma or it can get confused with a schwannoma. All right, so that's one example. And this example is actually relatively well circumscribed, but oftentimes these tumors are more infiltrative and infiltrate the surrounding um, adipose tissue. They most commonly occur in the lower leg, particularly the foot or the ankle, and they are usually in the subcutis. But because of their infiltrative growth, I think they have a tendency, uh, studies have shown between 30 and 50% of them can recur uh, locally. Let me show you a few other exam examples here. So here's another one, and from low power, you can again see already very dilated vessels. Some of them have fibrin in the vessel lumen itself. Some of the fibrin starts to leak out of the vessel, and around the vessel wall, you can see uh, this homogeneous pink hyalinization. You can see that hemosiderin is present, like in the previous case, and nuclear pleomorphism. Get that in focus there. And again, pleomorphism, but without mitotic activity or very low mitotic activity. And there can be a variety of inflammatory cells in the background, particularly mast cells you often see, but you can see other types of inflammatory cell present in the background of this tumor as well. There's some more of that pleomorphism in here. Now, the other thing about this tumor that's kind of interesting is when it when it infiltrates out and into the adjacent um, adipose tissue, it um, it has a pattern that has been referred to by Andrew Fulp and Sharon Weiss as early fat, early pleomorphic hyalinizing angiotatic tumor. So when it infiltrates the adipose tissue, there'll be spindle cells that usually aren't quite as atypical. There'll be hemosiderin deposition, and this pattern is actually very very similar to another entity which is called um, hemosiderotic fibrolipomatous tumor. Let me show you an example of early fat. Uh, here we go, this slide is a little faded, but you can see here that there's a lot of uh, mature adipocytes here FAT fat, mature adipocytes, and they're being infiltrated by spindle cells. And when we go closer, these spindle cells aren't very atypical. They're kind of bland spindle cells with a little bit of a mixoid background and they're infiltrating into the adipose tissue and there's hemosiderin deposition. And so this is very basically microscopically identical to what, what's been referred to in the past as hemosiderotic fibrolipomatous tumor, which is another tumor that seems to be um, uh, intermediate malignant potential. It, it can be uh, locally recurrent oftentimes, but doesn't 
um, metastasize on its own. But the thought is that that the hemosiderotic fibrolipomatous tumor may actually be a precursor to pleomorphic hyalinizing angiectatic tumors. See, all of these tumors have really long names, and this is part of why soft tissue pathology is so hard. And interestingly, there's been uh, there have been a, a handful of papers and a lot of presentations in recent years. Uh, this video is being made in um, February of 2018. So over the past few years, there's been a lot of activity looking at the molecular background of hemosiderotic fibrolipomatous tumor or early early fat, um, and also pleomorphic hyalinizing injectatic tumor. And what has been found is several studies have found that um, there are rearrangements of two different genes that are seen in at least some of these cases. And those genes are TGFBR3 and MGEA5. Don't worry, I'll put a link in the video description down below with some more papers and information that you can look into if you want to read about this. This is still an evolving area, but um, uh, several papers have suggested that that these translocations or gene rearrangements are present in hemosiderotic fibrolipomatous tumor and pleomorphic hyalinizing angiectatic tumor, at least in some cases. And interestingly, those same genes have also been implicated, um, at least by some studies, in another tumor called myxoinflammatory fibroblastic sarcoma. So there's a thought that maybe all three of these entities are somehow related. Not all authors agree on this, so again, this is a kind of cutting edge, evolving area, at least as of now in 2018, and I imagine this will get fleshed out and more, more fully understood over the coming years. But for now, if you're interested in soft tissue pathology and want to learn more about the molecular background of these entities and how they might be related, you can go and uh, do some reading uh, in those links down below. So this is, uh, often you'll see areas like this that look like hemosiderotic fibrolipomatous tumor at the periphery of a well-developed um, fat, ple uh, pleomorphic hyalinizing angiectatic tumor. And here's, here's another example that in the center, you have kind of well-developed features of fat. You have the dilated vessels that have, this is a perfect example. Look at that dramatic, dramatic fibrin deposition here. I've got the condenser on so you can really kind of see it refractile. I'll flip that so you can see it normally. But you see the dilated vessels with a really homogenized fibrin deposition in their wall. Really nice example. And then over here somewhere, there are the pleomorphic spindle cells. So beautiful example of fat. And then as you go out towards the periphery, you can see that adipocytes are entrapped in the tumor. There's a lot of hemosiderin. So very nice example, probably of kind of some of that early fat merging with the more well-developed fat. So again, these, uh, these can be problematic because they do recur. And also, you know, doing excisions on tumors in the ankle or foot that are infiltrative at the edges can be problematic to clear the whole tumor without causing functional impairment to the patient. So it's always, it always has to be a careful decision between the surgeon and the patient and the whole treating team about how to best manage each individual case. But the ideal, the ideal thing, in an ideal world, you'd want to have a wide local excision with negative margins, ideally. And this is a good example of here's the skin epidermis and dermis, and down here in the subcutis, that's where we often see fat present. Now let me show you another example that's a bit more cellular than the other ones I've shown. So here's another example. It's, it's more cellular, and you can see it's definitely infiltrating the adipose tissue. And this one I want to show because it's got a few nuclear changes. Let me see if I can find the area. I should have put a dot on the slide. This is the problem with making videos. Once the recording's on, you'll never find what you were looking for. All right, let's see if this will work. So here, this cell right here, I'm not sure if it'll show up or not. These, uh, the tumor cells in pleomorphic hyalinizing angiectatic tumor tend to have nuclear pseudo-inclusions. Little vacuoles or bubbles in the nucleus that are filled with cytoplasm that's kind of invaginated into the nucleus. And so that's a common feature that you often see in fat. And so uh, finding nuclear pseudo-inclusions fits really well with this diagnosis. Oh, here, these are actually quite good. Ooh, that's really nice, okay. So you can see right here, 
this is pseudo inclusion, pseudo inclusions. So, um, and then here, down here, I don't think it's on the screen. Here's another one. Right there, that like round circle of cytoplasm that's pushed into the nucleus. Um, that's a nice nuclear pseudo inclusion. And so these features are all really good for pleomorphic hyalinizing angiectatic tumor. So the main take home points is don't confuse this with schwannoma, which is totally benign, and don't confuse this with undifferentiated pleomorphic sarcoma. And the way to tell it apart from that, remember, is that these should have pleomorphism, but usually very low mitotic rate. And um, these are a good, uh, a rare entity, but one that's good to know about because every once in a while you'll come across one and not know what to do. But hopefully now that you've seen this video, you will. So thanks again for watching. If you uh, like the video, please click like down below. And if you leave any questions you have in the comment section, that would be awesome. And you're also, uh, feel free to comment and uh, tell me what kind of videos you want to see uh, from me in the future.